The two following presentations will cover marine envenomations. It is estimated that there are over 2,000 venomous or poisonous species living in our lakes, rivers, streams, and oceans. For this presentation, we're going to focus on those in the ocean. There are three mechanisms by which envenomation can occur. Bites, nematocysts, and stings. At the end of this presentation, we'll also cover coral lacerations and their complications. In relation to bites, we're going to focus on those that occur via octopi and sea snakes. The blue-ringed octopus lives in warmer waters, specifically Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean. Bites from a blue-ringed octopus generally occur during handling-related incidents in which a scuba diver or person will see a blue-ringed octopus and try to pick it up or play with it. The blue-ringed octopus contains a small beak that will deliver its saliva below the skin, which contains a tetrodotoxin-like substance, which is a sodium channel blocker. This will result in the person experiencing paresthesias, muscle weakness, and in severe cases, respiratory arrest. Not all bites are fatal. One thing that's important to note about blue-ringed octopi is that these are very small animals, smaller than most palms of a person's hand, uh, averaging only 8 inches in length. It is estimated, however, that one octopus has enough toxin to kill 10 adults. If a person is bitten by a blue-ringed octopus, they may not experience any symptoms other than localized sight pain for about 15 minutes. First aid warrants local wound care with irrigation, dressing the wound, updating a person's tetanus status, and providing analgesia. If a person develops respiratory symptoms, it's important to initiate respiratory support via mechanical ventilation. The sea snake is an elapid, uh, also known as the coral reef snake, so similar to the coral snakes that we find on land. It's present in warm waters as well as you can see here. Besides living in the ocean, another huge difference between sea snakes and land-based coral snakes is that the venom of a sea snake is myotoxic, affecting the muscles, whereas land-based coral snakes have a neurotoxic venom. The symptoms of a sea snake bite will include localized pain, tissue injury, myalgias, tenderness, trismus, and ultimately muscle fatigue. In severe bites or severe envenomations, where there's a large amount of muscle damage, a person can develop rhabdomyolysis, along with all of its complications, including hyperkalemia, acute renal injury, and dark urine from the myoglobin. It's important to provide local wound care, as previously discussed with the blue-ringed octopus, as well as supportive care with analgesia, correcting any electrolyte disturbances, specifically hyperkalemia, and providing IV fluids and sodium bicarbonate for signs of rhabdomyolysis. In an instance of a sea snake bite, it is essential to contact a toxicologist because there is an antivenin that is available to help reverse the effects. Moving on to the next mechanism of envenomation are nematocysts. Nematocysts are spring-loaded venom cells. They contain a tiny hair-like projection which, when touched or triggered, it will release a barb that contains a thread and the venom. This is a picture of a nematocyst. Going from the top at A down to D, you can see how it occurs that the barb with the thread is released. Nematocysts are commonly found on the tentacles of jellyfish, although they also are found in fire coral, as we'll discuss in a few moments. It's important to note that they are functional even after an organism's death meaning that if a dead organism containing nematocysts is touched, the nematocyst can still be triggered, releasing the barb, the thread, and the venom. The most common animal that utilizes nematocysts is the jellyfish. Jellyfish are found worldwide, including the Arctic region. They are often difficult to see due to the fact that they are transparent or translucent. Almost all jellyfish stings are via accidental contact because jellyfish by nature are not predatory or hunting humans. The picture here is of an Australian box jellyfish, which will become important in the next slide. Symptoms of a nematocyst envenomation are predominantly dermatologic, with pain, burning, and itching to the site, followed by red urticarial lesions, which can last up to 10 days. In severe instances, necrosis at the site can occur. If a person sustained large tentacle contact from the box jellyfish, which we saw on the previous slide, 
rapid cardiac arrest can occur. The Portuguese man-of-war, while not technically a jellyfish, also utilizes nematocysts for envenomation. It's found in warm waters, seen here. The effects of a Portuguese man-of-war envenomation are similar to jellyfish in that there is a localized dermatologic reaction, but there can also be cardiopulmonary effects with complete collapse of the circulatory system, and in the musculoskeletal system you can develop focal limb paralysis, which if you are swimming has been known to result in drowning. The final organism we'll talk about in relation to nematocyst envenomation is fire coral. Fire coral is found worldwide and is not technically a true coral. It does create a localized reaction similar to the other nematocyst envenomations with urticaria, redness, edema, and in this case, vesicle formation. Nausea and vomiting have been known to happen but are rare. Fire coral envenomation is not to be confused with coral lacerations, which will be discussed in the next presentation. The picture to the left is an example of what fire coral looks like. And the picture on the bottom right is an example of the fire coral dermatologic reaction. Now that we've discussed the three organisms that are predominantly responsible for nematocyst envenomation, we'll move on to the treatment of nematocyst stings. The first step in first aid treatment of nematocyst envenomation is to remove the tentacles. This can be done in several ways. Some people recommend taking a credit card with its edge and simply scraping along the skin where the sting occurred. Other people have advocated for taking tape and simply applying it to the area to remove the nematocyst that still might be present. The next step would be to apply either hot water or acetic acid. This is an area of contention with many experts advocating for different approaches. At the end of the day, the point of either using hot water or acetic acid, aka vinegar, is to prevent further nematocyst discharge. And while we don't know which is better to prevent discharge, we do have clinical studies showing that hot water is superior for pain relief, and that's water at a temperature between 40 and 45 degrees Celsius. What we do know also is to avoid cold water, as that is believed to discharge the nematocysts which will simply make the condition worse. The first aid provider should also initiate antihistamines, analgesia, and in the case of the Australian box jellyfish, antivenin. Finally, as you would do with any patient, if a person's cardiovascular system seems to be compromised, provide support for that. To finish up this presentation, we'll talk about a few other conditions related to nematocysts. The first being sea bather's eruption. It's a pruritic dermatitis that actually is a result of nematocyst larvae becoming pressed between a person's bathing suit and their skin, resulting in firing of those nematocysts and something that appears to be sea lice. Now, as I mentioned earlier, nematocysts will stay functional even after the organism is dead. So it has been noted that sea bather's eruption can recur if the suit is worn later on and the nematocysts are still present. Irukandji syndrome is a specific syndrome related to a single type of jellyfish found in the northern Australia region, C. barnesi. The syndrome starts off like most nematocyst envenomations with a mildly moderately painful local reaction, but 20 to 40 minutes later a myriad of symptoms can develop, some of which are deadly but most just annoying. Finally, we'll discuss the cone snail. And while the cone snail does not really use a nematocyst, it does use a harpoon-like apparatus to catch its prey. It is a very slow-moving carnivorous predator, so having a apparatus such as this, or a tool such as a quick harpoon to deliver its venom is essential to its survival. Its venom is a complex protein mix, including ion channel blockers. This will produce pain, numbness, and in severe instances, paralysis, which can be partial or complete. The treatment of any cone snail envenomation is only supportive care, including mechanical ventilation if apnea results. The top left shows a picture of a cone snail. Envenomation typically occurs when a human tries to retrieve the shell. 
On the bottom right is a picture of a cone snail releasing its harpoon to envenomate its prey. In the next presentation, we'll cover the final mechanism of envenomation, stings, and then briefly discuss coral lacerations and their complications.